Okay, welcome everyone. As it is now 1230, I would like to welcome everyone to this presentation on Postgres security by Joe Conway, Deep Thoughts Betting on Security. This presentation is provided as part of the PGCon Conference 2020. It will be recorded for full use by that conference. Anything that is said or shared during this presentation or in the conversations around this presentation will be publicly available. So thank you very much for making time to join us today. Tom, you are authorized to proceed as necessary. And Joe, I'll turn it over to you for your presentation on Deep Thoughts, Betting on Security. All right, thanks. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, first, I'll introduce myself since this is for the conference. Um, I'm Joe Conway. I've been uh, around the Postgres community for 20 plus years now, um, contributing for most of that and uh, con a uh, committer for about 17 years. I'm also presently a uh, major committer or a major contributor and a uh, member of the PGM for team and the VP of engineering at Crunchy Data. So first, a little background. Um, I like to think about security when it comes to Postgres in a holistic way. Um, you know, basically your goal is to allow people to access the stuff that you want them to be able to access and the people that you want to be able to do that access and to prevent other people from accessing stuff. So in a nutshell, that kind of describes what your goal is for security. The way you achieve that or the way you should at least um, think about um, trying to achieve that is that you want to provide a defense in depth. You want to have multiple layers. Uh, I think of it in terms of a, a, this hardened shell and a crunchy core. Um, you know, the shell being protecting yourself from the outside, the crunchy core being once someone's inside, uh, making sure they can only do the things that you want them to do. And you achieve that also through uh, what I've called confinement, um, which is reducing the attack surface. And also importantly, I don't, I don't think a lot of people talk much about uh, monitoring alerting when it comes to security, we tend to think of monitoring and alerting from the standpoint of availability and performance, but those are both very important for purposes of security as well. Um, this particular talk is going to focus on the crunchy core aspect of this holistic approach to security. I do have another talk um, I've given that's online uh, from FOSDEM earlier this year on reducing attack surface on PGSecCom. So the, the premise of this whole talk is, you know, do you want to bet? Um, if I create a brand new, fresh Postgres installation and create an empty database, and then I add fairly small number of things to that database, granted seven users and three group roles is probably more than a lot of people do, still not that many, I'm doing that for illustrative purposes. If only creating, I'm only going to create two tables of view function. I'm going to do one explicit grant and add one extension. And the question is, would you be willing to bet, you know, let's say your salary or, you know, a dozen rolls of toilet paper uh, that you could describe for someone all of the uh, security implications uh, inside that database, who can see what? Do you, do you feel confident that just with a small number of objects, you could figure that out? And I think by the time we're through with this talk, you'll realize that it's, it's more complicated than you might think. So first we're gonna start with some fundamentals. Um, roles uh, in Postgres are both users and groups. Um, users and groups are really just different forms of a role. And really the only difference is that a quote unquote user has the ability to log in. Uh, I'm gonna get to this in a few minutes, but one of the um, properties of roles is something that I've dubbed an attribute. I don't think it's actually a, an official name for that, but um, 
there is an attribute called login attribute, or you can call it no login. Basically, two ways to say um, true or false, whether a user can log in or whether a role can log in. And by uh, definition, basically, if a role can log in, we're going to call it a user. However, you should understand that because roles are just roles, users can still have members just like groups. And we're going to see that a little bit too. The other thing to note here is that roles are created at the instance level. So they're common to all databases. If you create a role in a Postgres instance and you have two or three databases, that role is going to exist across all those databases. So as I mentioned, roles, uh, I've kind of tried to describe, a lot of these terms get overloaded. So it was a little difficult coming up with the, the words here, but um, what I've described here are security relevant properties of roles. And I've broken it into four different groups, um, attributes, membership, privileges, and settings. So attributes are the things that you can add to a role when you create it or alter it. Um, they're basically capabilities like, uh, can this role log in? Is this role a super user? Another property of roles is membership. So as I mentioned, users can belong to groups or one role can belong to another role. And that can be either direct or indirect. You can have a whole hierarchy of roles belonging to roles belonging to roles. And this has some pretty significant implications as well. Privileges is the specific term that's being used for permission on a database object, some sort of access permission. And that, so an example of that is select on table or insert on a table or execute on a function. Uh, and then there are Postgres configuration settings, um, some of which are um, security relevant, such as search path. And you'll see later on why I say search path is security relevant, but those can be bound to a specific role so that when that role logs in, it gets that specific value of that specific setting. So these are all different properties of roles that are relevant to security. So we'll drill in a little bit more now. Attributes, basically these are all of the attributes that are defined in the create alter role commands as options. And you can see the majority of them here have both a, um, an affirmative and a, uh, and a not uh, affirmative um, version. So you can have super user or no super user, or create DB or no create DB. Basically, those are just the way that we express a Boolean option on the uh, create or alter role commands. So super user obviously defines the role as a super user. Create DB, you can create other databases, create role, you can create other roles. And that's an important one because if you can create other roles, you potentially can give those other roles capabilities that you don't have. Um, inherit is an important one because that basically says, does the role, if it belongs to another role, is it going to inherit the privileges that have been assigned to that, to that other role or to that group? Um, and inherit means you get them directly. And again, we'll go into that a bit, what that means in a little bit a uh, little bit later in the slides. Login means you can log in. If you can't log in, then you're effectively a group. Um, you can a container that can can aggregate privileges, if you will. Um, whether or not you can do replication, whether or not you can bypass RLS, and then there's a few others: connection limit, uh, password, and valid until, which are not booleans, but they're really attributes that are relevant to security. Um, of a role. Now, there are several ways that you can make one role a member of another role. Um, the preferred method is the role form of the grant command. So if you say grant role Y to role X, that means you're making X a member of Y. Um, so Y in this case is, is a quote unquote group and X is presumably a user, although it could be another group. You can have multiple higher, multiple level hierarchy. Now, there's a nuance here is that if 
Role X um, is a member of Role Y if there is a chain of grants. Um, but it has usage of Role Y if all along that chain, every one of the roles has the inherit attribute except for the last one, because that one doesn't matter in this case. So if role X belongs to role Y, which belongs to role Z, and they all have inherit, which is the default, then role X automatically and immediately has the same privileges granted to it as role Z did. But if role X is no inherit, then in order to get access to those privileges, role X would have to use a set role command. So we would have to take an, a specific action in order to get access to those privileges. And there is a, a function that's built in called BG has role to determine if, a, uh, if role X has a member or usage of role Y. Privileges are gained via system defaults and explicit grants. Um, you can remove them using a revoke statement. You have to be mindful of what I was just talking about, um, indirect privileges and the differences between usage and being a member where you have to set a role in order to access those privileges. And there's a, a notion of a public group, which is, what I call a pseudo group because it's not literally the same thing as a, a role that has members in Postgres. Basically every role has usage to the privileges that are granted to public. And importantly, public is granted some privileges by default. We'll see that later. Um, public membership is also not, in, not affected by no inherit. So even a role that has the no inherit attribute is going to have automatic and immediate access to the privileges that have been granted to public. So this is, it's, it's much of a, you know, it's a nuance, but it's an important one. And public membership is not reflected in the catalog table PG auth ID if you were to go look. And the fourth security relevant property of roles or settings. Um, configuration settings, as I mentioned earlier, can be bound to roles. And you would you would do that using the alter role command. So you would say alter role, whatever, and then set some parameter to some value. And this is just a list of three um, configuration parameters that are security relevant. Um, dynamic library path actually determines um, where Postgres looks for shared objects get, that get loaded. Row security um, determines whether or not RLS is enabled or not for a particular user. And search path um, will determine which objects are found when, um, when they're referred to in an SQL statement without um, a schema qualification on it. So in terms of when you become a role um, or the, the security relevant properties of a role are gained in different ways. Um, attributes of a role are only gained when you either log in directly as that role or you use set role to switch to that role or you use set session authorization to switch to that role. So in other words, even though you might uh, have been granted um, a role or a group that is has the attribute of super user, you cannot do super user things unless you set role to the super user or set session authorization to the super user that you have access to. Whereas the super user also bypasses privileges and you do get access to that fact. Set session authorization um, basically is uh, gives you a more complete um, way to uh, to impersonate another role. Uh, it's only available to super users. 
Basically, when you set role, Postgres will change the current user to the role that you set to. When you set session authorization, it changes both the current user and the session user. And it's the session user that's used by Postgres to determine what role you can then set role to. So in other words, if, if um, I'm logged in as the super user and I do a set session authorization to Joe, then from that point, I can only set role to, to other roles that Joe has access to set to. Whereas if I was logged in as the super user and I set role to Joe, I could set role to essentially any other role. Privileges are immediate if uh, use, you have usage on another role, otherwise you must set role to them. Um, but configuration settings are only applied when the role logs in directly. So even though you set role to another role, you're not going to necessarily, you're not going to get the configuration settings that have been bound directly to that role. So again, a lot of nuances here, subtle things to be aware of as you're moving around between roles. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about the uh, scenario that I had you betting on earlier. Um, we're going to install, you know, install Postgres, create a database, create the roles, create the objects, and we're going to install uh, an extension called Crunchy Check Access, which is going to facilitate the inspection of, of all of these things. So we're presuming at this, by the point we get to this slide, Postgres has been installed. I'm now creating a database called Deep Dive. I use PSQL to, to uh, access Deep Dive, and I'm going to create the, um, the users and groups that I talked about earlier. Now, a few things to note here. I can use the syntax create group to create a group called end users, and this group is going to be a no inherit. I can use the syntax create user to create DB Atom. DB Atom is going to be a super user. Create user to create Joe. Now Joe is going to belong to role end users. So that makes Joe a member of end users. Create Now here I'm using create role Bob, but it's a login role. So that's equivalent to creating a user. And it's a no inherit. Create role Alice. No inherit. It's going to belong to end users. Mary is going to be part of the group Joe. Sue is just a standalone user. App user is another login user. DB Adams is, has a member named Sue and another member named Bob. And Bob is actually an admin of this role, which means Bob can grant other roles membership in this role. And then I finally a group called apps and I'm going to grant explicitly now, this is the role, the grant syntax. I'm going to say I'm granting the role Joe to Alice. So now Alice is going to be a member of Joe, even though Joe is a login user. And I'm going to grant DB Adam to end users. So a little bit of complexity there, but not, it's not terrible. So I showed you three different ways for affecting role membership. You did create user in role, which says one role is a, is a new member. The new role is a member of the other role. I did create role and then role at the end, which says the new role is a group, but it's initially with members that are specified. And then I did the grant syntax. And again, even a user like Joe can have members like a group. Now, this is what it looks like when you inspect the resulting roles. It's a bit of a hodgepodge, but um, you, you can get a sense here. Alice is no inherit. You can see what mem what she's a member of these groups and so on. So now we're going to create a few objects, we're creating two tables, T1 and T2. T2 references T1, create a single view, 
which is basically a join T2 to T1. And I, I'm doing all of this as the Postgres user, so as the super user, creating a function which selects from that view. And then I'm granting select on the view to two specific roles. So again, I, I give everyone a second chance. You know, or would you be willing to bet that you can articulate all of the security implications of this relatively simple database? And I think the answer is probably no, but um, we'll see just how complex it actually is. So now we're going to talk a little bit about CrunchyCheck Access. It's an extension that I wrote to help inspect um, privileges in a database. You can get it off of GitHub from the Crunchy Data organization. Um, you install it just like most other Postgres extensions. Uh, and then make sure you create the extension in the database in which you want to use it. So first take on what, who has permission to what? We're going to ignore the, uh, the Postgres default super user, and we're going to ignore objects that exist in the system catalog. And we're going to run this query that uses a view in the check access extension called all access. And we're, so we're ignoring the super user because we're logged in as Postgres and, and we're going to basically ignore all rows where the base role is the Postgres user. And this outputs 984 rows. So in that small number of objects and a fairly modest number of roles, this is what it looks like when I run that. You can see there is a lot of output. We're not going to try and go through all of that output in detail, obviously, but we do in fact get 984 rows. A few things worth taking a look at here. This role path gives me the, the base role, or it also gives me the base role through some other path to get access to the object. So in this case, I've got Alice who is no inherit, that's what the false means here, can access the end users role and end users has uh, this connect privilege on the database deep dive. So that's quite a bit of output um, for, as I said, a, a pretty simple database. Now there's a couple of ways we can reduce some of the output and some of the complexity here. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things in this output is that we see that there are items, if we scroll down here, uh, with grant option. So we'll see the same row basically twice, once, without and once with this grant option. What grant option means is that this role could actually grant this option that it's got, this, this privilege that it has to another role. And by default, any role that's got super user has the ability to grant to other users. And so, we know, we're going to see, we know hopefully who is able to become super user in our database. And that basically is going to double up all the rows in this output for those users. So we're going to, we're going to ignore those for now. Also, uh, there is, um, Postgres accepts the term temporary as well as temp for the spelling of temporary objects. And so that creates duplicate output in, um, in the check access output. So we're gonna eliminate the duplication from that. 
There's also a number of roles. Um, see if we can scroll down and find some of them. Here we go. So there's a number of roles that are defined that are something like PG underscore. And those are default roles that have been built into recent versions of Postgres, uh, basically so that um, things that had kind of traditionally been required super user access can now be granted in, in a more granular fashion to other roles so that you can avoid giving out super user to do specific things. Um, we're going to eliminate those because that could be a whole nother talk probably in terms of understanding what capabilities those built-in default roles give you. And then finally, as I pointed out, um, there are multiple paths to privilege. Um, a user such as Alice may have direct access to a particular privilege but also might have access to that same privilege through one or more other paths, such as Alice can go through Joe, to go through end users, to go through, to get to DB Atom, and as DB Atom has a particular privilege. So we're gonna coalesce all of those um, duplicate uh, access paths uh, down to one in order to try and better understand what's going on here. So with all of that taken into consideration, we're gonna to aggregate to eliminate the unneeded duplication. We're gonna ignore the with grant. We're gonna eliminate the duplicates from temporary. We're gonna ignore the default roles. We're gonna ignore the multiple paths, the privileges. This query here is now gonna be run, uh, which does all of that. And I've got the output of that here. And you can see now we've only got 51 rows and things are a bit easier to comprehend. So now we can see that um, the database object type has three different privileges. And these are the roles that have access to those specific privileges. And if we look at it a little more closely, we'll note that basically these these um, long lines have extra roles that have super user access. And these shorter lines um, are just the super users. Uh, actually, correction, these longer lines have the non-super users in them, and the shorter lines are essentially just the super users. So we'll get to that as we go through the slides. So we've already talked about this, but it bears repeating that um, public group is a pseudo group. Every role has usage. Um, there are some privileges granted to public by default. And um, public membership is not affected by no inherit. And it's also not reflected in the system catalog. And that there are, are paths to privilege that derive from the default grants to this public pseudo group. So that by default, the public pseudo group has temp and connect on database, has execute on functions, and has usage on language domains and types, for instance. So now let's go through these object types one at a time. As I showed you here, object type database, everybody has temp and connect, and they get that through their def through the default grant to public. And just the super users have the create um, attribute or the create privilege, I should say, in for the database object type. Object type function, um, important thing to understand here is that functions are disambiguated um, by both the name of the object as well as the pattern of the input data types. 
So, and that's because functions are allowed to be overloaded in Postgres. So I can have two functions called all access that take different pattern of arguments and they refer to two different objects in Postgres. So each object has its own grants associated with it. In this case, the all access, check access, and my privs, my priv sys were all installed by the check access extension. And in that extension, there was an explicit revoke of execute from public um, for these, which means they're only executable by the super users. And there was an explicit grant execute to public for the ones that I wanted everyone to have access to execute. So these are noted in green because this is kind of all good. This function get inventory is executable by everyone. And that's because of the default grant execute to public that exists in Postgres. So we didn't necessarily intend this get inventory function to be executed by everyone, but it is. Object type, type language, um, C and internal are only uh, available, usage available to super users. Important point here is usage does not mean the same as execute. Usage of a language means you can create a function in that language. Execute means you can execute a function that someone else may have created in that language. So this only pertains to the ability to create functions. Uh, only super users can create C and internal functions. That's, and, and in fact, internal functions are internal. So they were created by the build, not by super users after the fact. But um, PL, PG SQL and SQL are default um, usage to everyone. And that's through the default grant to public. So everyone can create functions in PL, PG SQL and SQL languages. Now these are trusted languages, which means they should not be able to get outside the sandbox and should not be able to do bad things. But it's important to note that anyone can, can create functions in these languages, and that may or may not be what your organization really desires. Object type schema. Now, this one has got a lot of red on it, and that's because by default, um, not only does everyone have usage on schema, which means they can basically see what's inside it, um, they also by default have create on the public schema due to a default grant create to public. And this means that by default, everyone can create objects in the public schema. And this is dangerous. And there's actually a CVE written around it and some mitigations that were published, I think about two years ago now. And later on in this talk, I'm gonna go through a scenario that discusses that in great, great detail. Object type table, now this behaves more like what you would want and expect. Basically tables T1 and T2, all privileges are accessible to the super users, no big surprise there, surprise there. but there are no default grants and no explicit grants on either of those. And so no one except for the super users have any privileges there. Views, pretty much the same thing as tables. Um, there are no default grants on views. There were some explicit grants in the um, check access extension for the views that came with it, but those were intentional and so all is good there. So what do we take away from all of this? Well, the execute grant on function to public may be surprising to you. Um, and roles may have several paths, as I mentioned earlier, to, to a privilege for any function. And so even though in, in the example here, I revoke all on the function get inventory from the role Joe, and then I become Joe, 
and yet I can still execute this function. And so the question is, you know, why is that? Well, the answer to that is because public still has execute for the get inventory function and all roles, including Joe, are members of public. The other thing to take away here is that we should not forget what I'm calling latent privileges. So in this case, I am revoking all privileges on the get inventory function from public. So at this point, anyone who has not been explicitly granted execute on get inventory should not be able to run it. So you would think, except for super users. Well, so we become Alice and Alice tries to run that function and gets, a, um, gets an error, which is what we'd expect at this point. Alice is not a super user, Alice gets an error. Well, the problem here is if we stop at this point, we assume that Alice cannot run this function all is honky dory, except Alice can set role to DB Atom. DB Atom is a super user and therefore Alice can set role and execute that function. So if we're not being careful, we don't realize that even though it looks like Alice cannot execute that function, Alice actually can execute that function. Now, there's another kind of subtle takeaway I think that is worth mentioning here is that um, when, when you access a view, views are always accessing the underlying objects as the owner of the view, not as the role that's invoking the query that involves the view. Whereas functions, you can specifically at function definition time, you can say a function is either quote unquote security invoker or security definer. And the difference is, is that security invoker means that whoever is running the query that invokes this function, this function will execute with the privileges of that user. Whereas security definer means that the function executes with the privileges of the owner of the function. So you can think of a view as being a security definer, even though it's not explicitly stated as such, but a function is usually, because by default, it's security invoker, which means that the view is accessing objects as the owner of the view, whereas the function is normally accessing functions as the runner of the query. And that can lead to some confusing results. <clears throat> so if you remember from earlier, we created this view widget inventory, which selected from um, from the um, tables T1 and T2. And we created this function get inventory, which selected from the view. We granted select on the uh, view specifically to apps and end users. So now if I become app user, who's a member of apps, and I try and select directly from the table T1, I'm gonna get a permission denied. But yet, if I do select from the get inventory function, which is running as the app user, it still has access underneath the covers to table T1 because of the fact that the view was created originally by the Postgres super user. Okay, hopefully all that's clear. Um, maybe we should open it up for questions, uh, a quick break. Does anyone have a question at this point or should I just move on? Does anyone have any questions for Joe? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, hearing no, John, hearing none, wait, Joe, wait, why wait. don't you, oh, go ahead, no, sorry. I, du I double muted just to make sure. So I undid one mute and not the other. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Joe, just one quick question. 
it seems like the takeaway from all that for us non-DABA people who don't deal with roles and stuff, but still go in and muck with roles when we're doing stuff sometimes is follow the same thing you do with Linux machines. Basically, don't do things as root. Is that a good takeaway from what you just said? Generally, generally speaking, yes. Um, generally speaking, you would be better off trying to avoid doing things as the super user to the extent that you can. Um, there are some practices that are not necessarily bad ones where, for instance, you create the objects originally as the super user, but then as the super user, you change the ownership of those objects to a non-privileged user. And, and that's actually a pattern that I particularly like. And in fact, I like, I like the pattern where the objects are owned by a non, a no login role. Um, so that the owner of the objects is actually not a role that can log in directly and not a role that has anyone else belonging to it as a member. Um, but, uh, and that kind of gets into some other details that are probably further in the weeds than I would like to get into in this talk. Um, but we can always address that after the fact if you want to contact me. Does that answer your question well enough? Yep, thank you. Okay. okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Joe about what we've seen to this point? Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hello. Hey, do you recommend altering the permissions on the public schema to start? Oh, uh, well, we will see my recommendations on that um, at the end of this presentation, actually. Um, but the, in a, in a nutshell, yes, I will. I would um, highly recommend that you go through an analysis similar to what I've done here and think carefully about um, how things are set up in your database as you're initially setting it up, both in terms of how the roles are structured as well as how all the privileges are structured and, and things like default grants to public. So I, I, I'll be very much more specific at the end of the slide deck. All right. So that means we're going to get to recommendations. Fantastic. Does anyone else have any questions about what we've seen thus far from Joe? All right. Hearing none, Joe, why don't you keep going? Yeah, I'm kind of going to run short on time here if I don't try and speed through some of these uh, slides a bit. Um, but um, I will try and get through them. So CVE 2018-1058 um, um, describes how users can create objects that match names in other schemas. And basically, by doing that in the right way, you can alter other users' um, queries, uh, the behavior of those queries, in potentially malicious ways. And this is you know, basically a Trojan horse attack. Um, so in order to understand how that works, I'm going to have to go back to some basic fundamental principles again about how Postgres works. We, we talked a little bit about the concept of schemas. Schemas are essentially namespaces. They allow you to create objects with the same name of the same type that are in different schemas. So I can create a table named T1 in schema one and in schema two, it can exist in both. Um, by default, Postgres has a schema um, called PG catalog, which includes all the built-in objects. And let's hold on to that piece of information for a while. Um, new databases also have a schema called public. And we just kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, any connected user by default can create objects in the public schema. Postgres also has this concept of a search path. This is similar to you know, a Linux or Unix search path for, for binaries when you execute. It basically, um, the first object that matches the object that your query is trying to access, the, the first one in, in the search path is the one that'll get used unless you have specifically qualified your object name in your query. So if you said select star from 
public dot t1 then you are guaranteed to get data from the public dot t1 table but if you just say select star from t1 you're going to get t1 from whichever t1 existed first in your search path and again by default the search path is set to this dollar sign user which is kind of this built-in magic value that matches the session username and the public schema excuse me a sec so this is another thing to hold on to for a minute here we talked about function signatures and um, the fact that um, a function is disambiguated by both the name as well as the, the argument types. But another thing to understand here is that Postgres will go out of its way to do um, something called implicit um, data type conversions. So if I have a function named bar that takes an argument of type text and I call function bar in a select statement where the argument to my function bar is actually say a var car column from a table, Postgres will implicitly cast the var car to a text if that's the only function it can find. And it'll call this bar that takes text as an argument. However, if there's another function called bar in your search path that takes varcar as an argument, even if it's further down in the search path, that's actually a better match. And so if you're calling this function bar with an argument that's a varcar, it will use this second one, not the first one, if that second one exists. So the consequences of all this is, is by default, again, all new objects tables and functions, for example, are created in the public schema. Unqualified reference ob referenced objects are found in the public schema by default because of that public search path. And it's possible for an unprivileged user to create functions in the public schema. And they can create them such that the name matches the name of some function that is delivered by default with Postgres in the PG catalog. And you can create this function so it's got a different argument data type. But if you do that so that the argument data type of the one you create is a data type that is implicitly converted or coerced to a data type of the input function that exists in PG catalog, um, you can, based on what I've been saying, probably imagine what happens. Yours gets called, not the one that's in the catalog. So here's a, a simple example of that. If I create a function lower that takes a var car, and all it does in this case is it just appends the text Alice was here to whatever was passed in. And now if someone calls lower with a var car, it's going to shadow lower the lower function that's delivered by Postgres. And you can see that if you look in um, the existing functions that match lower right here, you'll see that there are two in the in PG catalog, one that takes text, one that takes any element, excuse me, one that takes text, one that takes any range. And then there's the one I just created in the public schema that takes varcar. So this is just portends bad things that are to come. So if I combine all of these things, the, the default um, create privilege for the public schema, the default search path, uh, the ability to create objects with the same names in different schemas, how Postgres searches the search path, the function signature resolution rules, implicit data type conversions, and the default ex execute grant to public for new functions. You combine all of these things. You know, it's, it's, it's like the classic case. It's, it's not just one thing that goes wrong. It's when multiple things go wrong at the same time 
that really bad and unexpected things happen. So this presents an opportunity for a user to basically create a function that's going to grant themselves super user if um, the right sequence of events happens. So here's a full example. I'm going to show you how to pwn someone's database if they haven't done the right things. In this example, I've created this table called categories. I insert some data in categories. I create, create a role called DB read only. So my intent here is that this is a read only um, user. And I set session authorization from the super user to the read only user. So as the read only user, I create this function called lower that takes var car as an argument. And in this function, I'm going to check does db read only have the super user attribute already? And is the currently logged in user a super user? And so if the currently logged in user is a super user and the db read only user is not a super user, I'm going to issue this alter user command, which makes db read only a super user. And then I'm going to simply return the lower function, but now I'm casting explicitly to text. So it'll pick the one in the catalog and that's what it'll return. So now later on, someone who's got the super user attribute is logged in and you can see that db read only at this point is still not a super user. And my super user just casually selects some data from the categories table using the lower function. This is a fairly, you know, I, hopefully your super users aren't logging in doing just random queries like this, but if they did, this looks quite normal. However, if I go look now, my DB read only user is in fact a super user. So that's why all of this stuff by default is dangerous and bad. And that's why there was a CVE written up on it. So the fix, it, the most simple fix um, is you don't allow unprivileged users to create objects in the public schema. Uh, and for that matter, any other schema that's in your default search path. So by default, if you do this revoke, create on schema, public from the public pseudo group, that will plug this hole. However, you might want to consider some other things while you're looking at this. Do you really want users to create, you know, unprivileged users to create temporary objects? Do you want them to create functions in PLPG SQL or SQL languages? Do you want them to even have usage on the public schema? Um, there's, there are definitely organizations uh, that I've been involved with where the decision is to not use the public schema at all, or even in some cases to outright drop the public schema, which is possible to do. Postgres creates it by default when you create a database, but you can drop it. And you also probably want to revoke, execute on new functions granted to public. So to address, uh, I think it was, if I heard correctly, Craig Kirsten's earlier, um, to address his question from earlier, what does the full fix look like? You want to ensure there's no abuse of the public schema. So you do, as I mentioned earlier, the revoke um, of create on the public schema from public. But as I mentioned, you might want to consider, you know, revoking usage or even dropping that schema. Um, you want least privilege. So we're going to, you know, for the, our example here, we're going to revoke temporary on um, the database from public. We're also going to revoke usage on these languages from public. And we're also going to alter the default privileges so that um, public does not get execute by default. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the other thing you want to do besides making sure that your privileges make sense is you want to make sure your roles make sense. Uh, you know, given the shortage of time, I'm not going to try and go through this in detail. You can get access to the slides and kind of figure out what I did here. <clears throat> but basically what I want to do is make sure I have a firm handle on who's got 
access to what? Who's able to, to become a super user? I want those who are able to become a super user to be no inherit so that they don't automatically get super user privileges. They have to actually set role to it. And I want my groups and the users in the groups to all make sense. So in other words, groups should be no login, not login users. Um, and I don't need so many levels. So basically if I um, do these, this set of commands here, I wind up with a much more kind of rational set of users in my database, users or roles in my database, users and groups. And now it's it's pretty clear that um, DB ad, um, admins is my group that has the super user attribute. It's um, cannot log in. I have a couple of users that are specifically in that group. My other users belong to either end users or apps. They explicitly don't belong to that group. And now when I go through and I run my query that I ran earlier that had 51 rows, and to be fair, I'm also going to screen out all of my super users here. But when I run that final query, and I look at the privileges that have been granted basically just to my non-super users, I get eight rows. Now this is much more understandable. I can see that my non-super users can connect. I can see exactly which functions they can execute. I can see that they can use the public schema, but importantly not create stuff. And I can see that they can select from certain views and that's it. So I still have, I think four minutes and I have, I think, time for a few questions. Indeed you do. Thank you, Joe. Does anyone have any questions on the back half of the presentation for Joe Conway? I have a question. This is Freka. So when you, uh, so when we add extensions, most of the functions go into, um, into a public schema. So when you, when you revoke privileges from public schema, what do we need to be aware of? Well, you could create a different schema from public and make sure that's in your search search path and your extensions will put the uh, the functions there. You you might need you probably need to create the extensions as a super user, um, so they they could still go into public. But if you don't want users using public, then you'll want them to use a different um, a different schema. Then then you just put that in your search path and send them there. I mean, the, the reason to not allow them to use public and or to even drop public is maybe just to reinforce the fact that, you know, you don't want them using those defaults. Um, fundamentally, if you have another schema that's in your search path, it doesn't make it a lot different. I think I, I have run across companies where they have policies like they, um, they don't have their objects in a schema that's in the search path which then in turn means that all objects have to be explicitly uh, qualified. So that if you write a query, you have to say schema dot table name, for instance, which makes your queries much more deterministic and explicit, right? So those are all possible things that, that you could do. Does that, that make sense? I think it does. And I think we have time for one more. Is there anyone else who has a question for Joe Conway? All right, hearing none, any final words, Joe, on your talk about security in Postgres? Um, no, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you all for being here for this conversation and this presentation. Have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Okay, we're now streaming live, Joe. Um, could you answer the questions for us, please? So Chris Brown asked the question that um, said, basically, with the oddity surrounding the public schema, does it seem advisable to try and fix it or even locally drop the public schema to eliminate the problem? And as I noted to him on IRC, the answer to that is basically on slide 48. Um, so if you go back to the video and you see on slide 48, my answer is basically that, yes, you should, you should revoke the, uh, the create access to the public schema from your, 
non-privileged users unless you explicitly want them to have that. And you might consider whether you should revoke usage or even just drop the public schema because Postgres doesn't require the public schema. It does exist by default, but you can, as the super user, as the database admin, you can get in there and drop that schema entirely if you'd like to. And, and depending on your specific needs, that might make sense. He, um, he followed up with a question, um, same person from Chris Brown, are public schema oddities partly a consequence of SQL standards? Are they, I don't know, honestly, the answer to that question, but I believe, I mean, I don't definitively know it, but I, I don't believe the OSQL standard really gets into um, whether the schema should exist and, and, and if it does exist, what privileges are granted to it by default. So I don't think the answer to that is the SQL standard. I think it's more uh, just legacy. Um, it's just the way it's been with Postgres for many, many years. And um, it's just something you should be aware of and you should probably change in your production systems before going live. I, it's handy to have it set up the way it is for development, but it's not safe on a production system. And I don't see any other questions. Did you see any others, Dan? No, I didn't. That was the only one I saw. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. It's much appreciated. I know it's much harder to do a, a talk in recorded mode than it is to, to do it live. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good right. one. Goodbye.